name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Good evening, St. Michael and all angels. I feel blessed to be back in the place that helped birth my ordination. I was ordained at this very spot 13 years ago, and I remember it because a particular event happened. Uh, the Reverend Nate Bostain and I were ordained together, and before the ordination, the vergers put us in the bride's room. And they said, you stay here until we come get you. So we waited, and we heard the processional. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. Sounds like worship is starting, but we stayed, because the vergers said stay. We opened the door, and we saw the streamers, the banners all come down the aisle, and we stayed. All of a sudden, everything got quiet. And we heard this uh, tapping of shoes. Tony Briggle runs into the garage room and says, well, y'all come on. You can't have an ordination without ordinance. It was like trying to start a wedding, but the bride is not there. So I'm blessed to be back in this place where I served from 2009 to 2012. I was director of young adult ministries here at St. Michael. I also was chaplain at Jubilee Park and Community Center, and I was chaplain at St. Philip's School and Community Center. One of the experiences I had while a priest at St. Michael, I call it a holy haunting. When I was walking the streets of Jubilee Park, this man approached me and he looked like Sammy Davis Jr. I didn't know him. He was short in stature, slim, probably in his late 40s. And he walks up and he says, Reverend, you're just the guy I need to see. Well, I didn't know who he was. He told me that he was recently released from prison and needed some clothes. Well, I said, sir, you're right. I am the man you need to see because I work with the ministry called One Man's Treasure. And this ministry uh, goal is to get clothes to people who are recently released from prison. I told him that it was late and I will go get his clothes tomorrow. He said he was hungry, so I gave him some food. He needed a travel voucher, so I gave him some bus transportation. And he gave me the address to the halfway house where he stayed. The next day I go and pick up his bundle of clothes from one man's treasure. It was five shirts, a slack, some shoes and some undergarments. And I go to the halfway house and I said, I'm looking for Richard. There's no Richard here. So I'll come back the next day. I'm looking for Richard. I have something for him. We don't know anybody by the name Richard. I went back the following day. Still no Richard. A week passes and I receive a phone call. Hello, Reverend. This is Joanne. I just wanted you to know that Richard hanged himself last week from a bridge downtown. Immediately, I thought about an article I read in the Dallas Morning News the previous week. It said that an unnamed man tied a shirt around a belt and hanged himself from the Houston Bridge at 6.30 p.m. that crosses the Trinity River. This highly public suicide stopped rush hour traffic. I met Richard on Monday. He died by suicide Tuesday. We hear the words from the great prophet Joel for this Ash Wednesday. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Joel, in, he gives a clarion call not to get people assembled for war or battle, but for penitence. The trumpet sounds and the people follow. 
Lent is a season of the Holy Spirit. It is an opportunity for us to turn toward God, inviting God to remove sin from our lives. And that is anything that's broken our relationship with God, with other human beings, with the created order, with nature, and even with ourselves. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Praying thy will be done means that we seek to align our will with God's will. And when our will and God's will are in perfect alignment, we are walking in the path that God desires for us. And in the seeking of that alignment, we also are inviting God to form us in the image and after the likeness of Jesus Christ by removing sin from our lives. And we seek this formation through worship, prayer, scripture reading, meditation, almsgiving, and outreach. We pray thy kingdom come to walk alongside God to help local communities and neighborhoods look more like God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is a very simple concept. It is not complex at all. And yet it is challenging to see images or examples of it. God's kingdom looks like a place where people have enough food to eat, have structures that bring about physical, emotional, and spiritual health, a place where people have adequate and affordable housing and live in a pristine, natural environment. If only Christians would work with residents in a community in South East Dallas called Crosstown and this area that was referred to as the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, if only there were a group of Christians who would work with this place to bring about an area where children could play safely in a park, where there could be early childhood development resources, where senior citizens could have adequate housing, where crime would plummet by 70%. It's already happened. Jubilee Park, a community center founded by this church for your golden anniversary. If only Christians would come together to address human trafficking and the 400 teens traffic each night in Dallas. It's already happened. It's happening with Project Moses at St. Michael and All Angels. Both of those ministries give the world a glimpse of the kingdom of God. One of the things that made the tragedy, Richard's tragedy, so powerful and saddening is how society continues to stigmatize those battling with mental illness and substance abuse, criminalizing these individuals. The Texas psychiatrist who released Richard did so because he had stayed the maximum amount of time, amount of time allowed three weeks. This is what the doctor's note read. Richard is suicidal with major depression, psychotic features, alcohol and cocaine abuse. The image of Richard, his lifeless body hanging from the bridge, stopping rush hour traffic is seared in my mind. Jesus was hanging from that bridge. The theologian, Dr. James Cone, poses this question in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Can one really understand the theological meaning of Jesus on a Roman cross without seeing him first through the images of blacks on the lynching tree? The image of Richard swinging from the bridge took me to the thousands of black people who were lynched swinging from trees, strange fruit, as Billie Holiday sang. And that took me directly to the cross. Jesus Christ embodies love. James Cone wrote, 
the loveliest lynchy was our Lord. Dr. Cohn called Jesus' dying on the cross the greatest example of love that the world has ever seen. Love hung on the cross. Gazing at Jesus, rather gazing at love hanging on the cross communicates to all who see it that the power of love exceeds the love of power. Love sent Jesus to the cross. Love lifted Jesus high on that glorious cross. Love reached out to Richard hanging from the bridge. Those who slammed on brakes driving under the bridge gazed at the image of the crucified one in our brother, Richard. The trumpet sounding within your soul means the Holy Spirit is changing your life. You can feel it in your body. You feel it in your spirit. You can touch it. The trumpet sounding in your soul means joining with other Christians to trumpet the good news for the world to hear. Christian tradition historically depicts St. Michael, the archangel, holding an orb in his left hand and a trumpet in his right hand, announcing that God's kingdom is coming. St. Michael community, continue to sound your trumpet. Will the congregation please